Hello and welcome to the Catholic Nerds Podcast, your undisputed source for quality Catholic nerdery. This is Scott. Mary. Cody. Colby. Join us for a dispute of multiversal proportions as we settle once and for all, which is better, Marvel or DC. This is only possible because joining us today is master Catholic apologist and debater, Mr. Trent Horn. Welcome to the show, Trent. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk about this. This is fun. (laughs) I just got done finishing today. Actually, I did an interview with an atheist on infinity and the Kalam argument. So it, it's fun just to talk about fun stuff. And it's late at night too. So <laughs> I think I have enough brain power to to talk about that, but it'll be fun. So well yeah. we need you to like tie your arm behind your back and um you know the mental version of that. <laughs> be kind to us. Don't let Scott fool you. He is a true nerd in the real sense. Yeah. Very good. Very good. <laughs> now we've uh we've built up our uh Titanic struggle pretty big here, but um we're gonna need you to take it easy on us. Okay. Um uh, even Not though that we're all clearly... ganging up at all. <laughs> <laughs> even though you've clearly given us the high ground of Marvel, I guess. <laughs> Not to throw shade. Sorry. Shots fired. <laughs> so so he's your team DC. Well, it... It really it it depends on the the medium and the format, but sure. I think in general I prefer more of the the epic and almost even cosmic elements of DC. Comparisons I've made in the past is that the D- DC comics is sort of like the stories of ancient Greek mythology come to life, basically mm-hmm. that it's the gods have come down among us. Uh, I mean, there's the, the DC video game, right? Injustice 2, gods among us, yes. right? That's the DC characters. They are these larger than life figures going up against larger than life foes. So I guess the elements in Marvel that I've enjoyed are those things that that parallel that in DC. So for example, I was really jazzed to see the trailer for Doctor Strange 2, the Multiverse of Madness. Yeah. And I mean, the fact I mean, that Spider-Man No Way Home... And the Loki series have opened the door to the multiverse because the multiverse was a huge thing in in DC Comics. I mean, it got so mm-hmm. bad that they had to reset everything in 1985 with Cry- I think it was 85 with Crisis on Infinite Earths because of just all the nonsense that was that was going on with that for continuity. So see, and that's why. Well, when it comes to uh, so, I'm really excited for. For that, I uh, what was the last movie? I think I maybe it was Shang Chi. I guess was the mar- last Marvel movie I saw. Oh no, it would have been Spider Man. Is that Sony yeah. Marvel? Yeah. Whatever. Uh, you know. Right, Sony Marvel. It, it's Marvel. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I bought tickets ahead, well ahead of time. Well worth it. Um, it's hard now though that like I'm getting into it a little bit. Looking at the trailer, like I probably should have just not watched the trailer, but I can't help it because now I am thinking ahead of like things they're going to do in Doctor Strange 2 and like they might include what's called the Illuminati Mm -hmm. and so that would be the multiversal council of like uh, you know Reed Richards Charles Xavier another Iron Man uh, you you know that the multiverse will be represented there so when it gets big like that I like that but I I don't like the the episode you know the comics about when the Fantastic Four went on unemployment that is a real (laughs) storyline (laughs) <laughs> you know, so I mean, and I appreciate I know like like why is Spider-Man so popular? It's because his comics and his stories. Why is he such a popular property? It is because he is the most relatable. You can't really relate to Batman. You right. can't relate to Superman. You can relate to Spider-Man, though. And so I give them props that relatability. But with the way I like these stories, I, I like him just to be above and beyond. You know, yeah. I think that is why, like, I think you hit kind of right on why more people are drawn to Marvel versus DC. Or at least it's at be- the moment. At the moment. It's because <laughs> of the moment. relatability. Like Marvel, uh, it, it seems that it's 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 always something that, you know, I could actually see that happening. Well, look at the first Marvel movie, the MCU, to start out to do their reboot to get things working in 2008 with Iron Man. Mm-hmm. It's just Here's a guy who made weapons and he feels bad about making weapons. So he makes a weapon to stop the people who have the bad weapons. We're not doing some crazy multiverse. Eventually we get there, but it's like, yeah, it wasn't completely improbable. It was potentially possible. 
Yeah. Well, and yeah, Ben yeah. Kingsley was the enemy in, in what, Iron Man 2, 3? Which one was it? Ben Kingsley. Oh, in Iron Man 3, he plays the yeah. main. I mean, that completely destroyed Gandhi for me, but that's also <laughs> <laughs> that's also a foreseeable kind of thing that they dragoon this actor into being this, this bad right. guy. Right, well, that was very controversial. And because- he wasn't really a bad guy. Guy, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and that was very controversial in Iron Man 3 because you think, oh, he's going to fight the Mandarin. The Mandarin was a very, fa- I mean, the Mandarin was really like, maybe kind of like the Lex Luthor to, to Tony mm-hmm. Stark, almost in the comics. Not, I mean, not to be confused with the Mandrill. <laughs> right. <laughs> not to be the Mandrill. <laughs> Which is one of the worst villains ever. <laughs> well, we'll get, to, we'll get to that soon. Yeah, yeah, we'll, get, we'll have to get to but, that. But uh, no, I mean, maybe. Maybe Justin Ham. No, Justin Hammer's a goon. He's I mean he's a rival. He's a goon in the movies. He's a rival. But really, when you think of like who was the person that really went up against Tony, it was the fact that the, the Mandarin had magic and so was able to really counter Tony's technology in the comics. And he has ma- rings he could do anything he needed to with and blah, blah, blah. Uh and so that was that was I remember that. I remember people being really mad, like, that's not the Mandarin. <laughs> and it was funny how they um retconned that in Shang-Chi. Yeah. Uh, by bringing Ben Kingsley back. And revealing the real man, yeah. Uh, so I, I thought that that was neat that they um, they did that. But even there, that's what we, you're right. They tried to keep it still grounded, but eventually, Iron Man creating this large universe, he can't. His armor becomes yeah. this magical nanotech that can do anything. <laughs> right. And, um, and that, that that part didn't even get really get explained. They just kind of brush over. Oh, I use nanotechnology. Is it? Yeah, it can okay. Be yeah, I, I guess I'll be the lone wolf because I would actually argue that Batman is probably the most relatable superhero because really? he is the most human in a way. Um, I mean, Iron Man to an extent, yeah, because he was just a rich guy that had the technology, but there sounds like you are... could be describing Batman or Iron Man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, well basically yeah, the same guy, just yeah. Iron Man, same guy, different universe. Stuff. I, yeah, well, but I, I also I, argue, I would also argue with Batman, he lives with the principle of subsidiarity, he served his own community to an extent. Right. So that's <laughs> what I'll argue. And I'll, until I'm he ends up with the Justice League doing all kinds of crazy right. shenanigans, the Super Friends Justice League. Now, I got to I'll push back on that because I give you that he doesn't have powers like Spider-Man has these powers. Right. But Spider-Man, the way he acts, uh, he acts like a 16 year old or a 20 year old who has had these powers dropped in his lap and he's trying to figure out what to do. Like if you read the actual like bio of of Bruce Wayne, he has like four doctorates, has trained in <laughs> 15 different martial. Like he literally he has like a doctorate in chemistry, a doctorate in, you know, all these other like criminology and forensics. He's trained in 15. I just started training. I did a martial art tonight. And he's like done. He like decided when he was eight years old, he's going to master 15 <laughs> different styles of fighting styles. And, you know, it's like it becomes it becomes a bit, you know, and then. The, but that's the thing why he's not. The reason Batman's not relatable is like when you and I are in a jam, we're like, oh no, what do we do? But Batman was always like, I had a plan for this. (laughs) (laughs) I counted on that. (laughs) And and I read recently, was it is Flashpoint uh, where you have Thomas Wayne? As Batman. Yeah, so yeah, so Flashpoint is that I think that was a 2000, I want to say 13 comic series, comic run. That was when the Flash goes back to save his mother. Uh, Nora Allen destroying and, everything. It, well, yeah, and in doing so, he alters the past in large, significant ways because, uh, you know, he kind of creates like a time quake, if you will. So he sends Superman's pod off course, and he prevents instead of Thomas and Martha Wayne dying in Crime Alley, it is Bruce Wayne who dies in Crime Alley, which leads Thomas Wayne to become a a murderous Batman. And Martha Wayne to become the Joker, because he has a psychotic break. So oh, wow. uh, yeah, the yeah the 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 animated film is pretty solid. It is a pretty solid adaptation of the comic uh, source material. Not all of. Like, I'm trying to think. What was the one? There was a recent it's DC animated film. Basically, the Biff Tanner of of the Batman world at that point, because he owns all these casinos. Yeah, you know? yeah. Biff Tanner went around, you know, yeah. killing Joker goons and stuff like that. No, there was what was it? There was a DC animated adaptation. I was super. Pu- oh, it was Injustice. Mm. It was the DC animated version of Injustice. They, you know, they they did that movie, 
And I was ready to, to watch it. I told my wife, like, I'm going to be up watching Injustice. If you want to watch with me? I know you won't. So, uh, <laughs> you know, but then I looked it up. And I, I saw the reviews on Amazon, like two stars. I was like, uh oh, yes. I go online. And it's just an absolute train wreck. It tried to cram mm-hmm. like five years worth oh. of story and leaves out the bad, leaves out the good stuff, botches things. It's just absolutely awful. But the, the DC animated Flashpoint is pretty good. I showed that even to Laura and she and she um, yeah. and, she yeah, and that, that, that brings up a very interesting like point to talk about whenever we get in more a into it. Well, not Flashpoint, but but the idea of the comics versus the cinematic, the, the, the cinematic universe. Yeah. Right. Um, because I mean, arguably, arguably the Marvel Cinematic Universe is, is like the best cinematic universe there is right oh i mean it it, it is it, like well what's it, interesting but i don't know it's funny it's like it's that and like the monster the the universal the monster verse from the early 20th oh, the universal century. studios right. monster yeah because that was the original yeah. one with the mummy yeah. and wolfman uh, wolfman this... they all lived in this they all lived in the same universe so with yeah. abbott and costello creature from the black lagoon yeah they they tried they tried their best to to resurrect it and it, it just one one gonna happen so um, marvel no marvel dragon. well marvel yeah. figured it out they're like oh we have a plan and we're gonna have a yeah. plan for yeah. the next 10 and 15 years and dc is like quick do something <laughs> who are these yeah. people at dc they're making millions of dollars and they're trusted with these decisions and they're just so bad at it so <laughs> right. i mean it's it's i will say like there are two DC movies that I really enjoyed uh, mm-hmm. that I can think of. Off, well, actually three now. Um, but uh, Aquaman was actually enjoyable. I really, I did enjoy Aquaman. And then the yeah, first yeah, because Wonder it was Woman, it wasn't Aquaman. It was Aqua Bro. That's why it's enjoyable. <laughs> probably, <laughs> yeah, probably. But then the first Wonder Woman, I, I like that was actually yeah, an entertaining good. movie. And we had such high yeah. hopes for the second one. We really did. <laughs> and then it devastated us. oh i didn't even or, go see it i yeah. i read i read the reviews there are a lot of there's a running list of movies that i just have not bothered to see yeah. star wars episode yeah. nine is one wonder woman 1984 <laughs> i just don't have time for movies that are that are bad i used to have time for bad movies but now it's like no nah, i just want to watch things that are that are then, good well I, here's then, the thing with dc they should not i don't know no they, they you can't be like Zack snyder make a dark gritty superhero universe no, people don't want that. You can you could take a different tone with it. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't have to be. We already had Dark and Greedy. That was Watchmen. And Watchmen was a good movie yeah. for what it was, what it was yeah. trying to do. But with these properties, they're not meant to be dark and gritty. But you, I mean, you can play them in a different way than Marvel. That's the thing that DC never learned is that, yeah, you, they're like, well, we're not going to be Marvel. You don't have to be Marvel, but you don't have to be this like depressing dreck. And a good right. example of that would be a great, probably the best Superman film mm-hmm. I've ever seen is a DC, DC animated movies are actually pretty good, which is ironic that like the DC animated, they, they get right in the live action, they don't. And that would be a, a film called All-Star Superman based on the comic mm-hmm. run, All-Star Superman. Oh, and, that one. oh, it's great. And so in that comic run in the movie, it's about Superman is dying because Lex Luthor has tricked him into overdosing on solar radiation and the entire movie is just about superman setting his affairs in order that's (laughs) it and now there's fights and there's monsters and crazy stuff and the movie feels a little rushed you're like suddenly this monster solar computer comes out of nowhere you're like what what was this Uh, you know (laughs) because it's hard to take a comic run and put it into a movie but it's good and what I liked about it was look up, but well, you can look up right now, even like look up the cover, All-Star Superman. The cover for All-Star Superman, it shows Superman just sitting on a cloud thinking. Like and Mary it's Poppins. A great, it's a great <laughs> image. And the, I forget who it was. Morrison. Yeah, I mean, there, there it is right there. And what's great about it is that one of the creators of the, the series I interviewed him. And he said like he saw like this guy at a comic book convention just like sitting like that, either dressed as Superman or someone else. He, he described it as almost like a shaman-like experience. And what is neat about it, he said, is like, normally when you want to depict Superman, you show him like rippling with muscles, standing, his chest puffed out, bullets bouncing off of him. But if you were truly invulnerable, you just relax. Yeah. You would just sit, yeah. you'd sit on a cloud yeah. and just relax. 
because you're invulnerable and nothing can hurt you. And that makes it neat to see the, the invulnerable man, what he's truly vulnerable to. So that's a great one. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but there's another one based on the comic run Superman Man of Tomorrow uh, or whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow, uh, which I heard that movie was actually pretty. That film was actually really good, that series. Because people say you can't do a good Superman movie. Yes, you can. Yes, yeah, you can. I mean, I grew up with the Sal Kind brothers, you know, Superman one and two, I guess the Richard Donner. Oh, the Donner movies. Yeah. Yeah. And those are great because it's interesting there because that just focuses on you have to understand who Superman is, uh, that, that you understand uh, the rules that he, he plays by, the hope that he inspires. Another good animated film that gets this well is Superman versus the elite. It's where Superman faces off against these four vigilantes and the public turns and supports the vigilantes because they execute supervillains. And the public says, well, yeah, Superman puts them in jail. They just get out again and they kill people like Superman's a, a wuss. And then Superman acts like he's gone crazy at the end. Like, you want to really see me not be a wuss and helps people to see because Superman is all about pulling his punches. Like mm -hmm. he, he knows he could turn some people into jelly if you punch them. And, you know, so that's what he's concerned about. But yeah, yeah. in the Snyder verse, it's just Mopey Man. It's not Superman, it's Mopey Man. I think it was that, even that's one of the things one of the I actually don't. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll say one of the more recent ones like that made, it was at the end whenever they, you know, he's fighting Zod and, you know, wagering his face off. It was like this massive shock because. Everybody's like, well, Superman doesn't kill people, right? Right. So it's like this this massive yeah. twist and and who his, his image is that it was, yeah, it was kind of like a it was like, what was the goal when, with him doing that, you know? Right. It's like, oh, I'm subverting expectations. So mm -hmm. no, you're not, not unless you haven't built yourself up to it or you're trying to make a particular point. It's still better than when Superman and Lois made out in Metropolis amidst <laughs> it'd be like if I rescued someone at 9-11 and I made out with with this person while the firefighters are running around, all these millions of people are dead. And now I will say this with Bat now Batman versus Superman is not a good movie. Uh, it's a bad movie, yep. but what was sad about that one is I had high hopes for that actually going into it. Mm -hmm. And the first scene is actually pretty good. And that is the scene when Bruce Wayne arrives in Gotham and is trying to go to the Wayne tech tower in Metropolis and he's like, I got to I got to call Jack. I'm like, who the heck is Jack? It's supposed to be Lucius Fox, whatever. Really? Who's Jack? I don't know. And I don't care. But he, he's driving there. And what's cool about that scene is like Ben Affleck, everyone's running away from the collapsing buildings and he's running towards it because Bruce Wayne is a disguise. Batman is who he really is. Mm -hmm. Bruce Wayne is the dis that's the difference between the two. Clark Kent is who Superman really is. He is a bumbling Smallville farm boy. That is who he is. And Superman is a disguise he puts on when he fights space monsters and bald uh, millionaires, you know. <laughs> but Batman, that's who he, since he was eight years old, that's who he is. And, and that's a disguise that he wears. Is that there's actually a nod to this in um, the third Dark Knight film? What is it, Batman? What's the third one? Dark Knight Rises where he's dancing with Anne Hathaway, Catwoman. And he's like, you're supposed to wear a costume. What costume are you wearing? He's like a billionaire, playboy, philanthropist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. That is the costume <laughs> yeah. he wears because yeah. that's not who he really is. So seeing that in the beginning when he's like rushing in there and seeing this, the contempt he has for the space god that destroyed this city in the blink of an eye. That was awesome. And then it all falls apart because Lex Luthor is being played by Daffy Duck. Wait, the guy, what was the guy? There was the guy Jesse, who was, he was Jesse, Jesse Eisenberg. Eisenberg. Yeah. He, oh, right, right. Here's how you could have fixed that in <laughs> the one social second. network Lex Luthor. Mm. No, that's it. I, if I was the director, I would say to Jesse Eisenberg, like, well, how do I play Lex Luthor? You're Mark Zuckerberg. Yes. You're not Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> pretending to be Lex Luthor. Just be Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> there you go. Because Done. that's basically who Lex Luthor is. Now, there, there was a line that Jesse Eisenberg said as Lex Luthor that I was proud to see the villain saying. Mm. I've, I've got here, I figured out way back, if God is all powerful, he cannot be all good. Mm. And if he is all good, then he cannot be all powerful. I appreciate that coming out of the villain's mouth and not the hero's mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that he's you know disparaging this. And it was weird because it was like, well, what is his motivation? He has this weird religious fixation or he's jealous of Superman. 
You just don't un- you just don't understand it. A better Lex Luthor villain plan, and it's just a dumb plan. And you can- and nobody can summarize what his plan is from Batman and Superman. It's impossible because it's a dumb plan. <laughs> a better plan, if you were going out, if you're Lex Luthor, is not to beat Superman by getting a monster to punch him. It's to get Superman to embarrass himself so people turn against him. And Lex Luthor already thought three steps ahead of that. Because that's, I mean, Superman has all these godlike powers. What can Lex Luthor do? Well, he's like one of the smartest people on earth. That is what he can do. And is always beating Superman. And they just squandered it. But yeah. maybe, oh, they, you alluded, maybe you they alluded to Smallville. It. Have you, I guess, were you a Smallville fan or did you just kind of reference it? Oh, I watched some. That was, that was a deep, that was back in the day for me. Yeah, I, I saw some of it, but I, I mean, there are 10 seasons I couldn't get. They did trick me to not trick me. They really lured me into the Flash, the Arrowverse crossover series because they brought right. Tom Welling into that. The Arrowverse is an interesting one too. Tom, like Tom that Welling's has... Buckaroo Banzai, right? I think so. He should just been Buckaroo Banzai. Yeah, but um, the Arrowverse is the interesting. That is the error in the opposite direction, where the Snyderverse goes to um, dark. The Arrowverse turns into just, they're not even, tr- it's just villain of the week, light right. and fluffy, just teen drama. Right. That was a hard one for me to see the, the downfall because my wife and I started watching, we started with Arrow season two. Then we watched season one. And then The Flash debuted the next season because Flash is introduced in Arrow two. I think it was Arrow two. Or maybe it was, I think it was Arrow two. Yeah, it's when Barry shows up. And then we started watching The Flash. And to me, the best seasons are Arrow season two and Flash season one. And then it's just downhill after that. And it's it's so, the stock is so low. It's unbelievable how bad it's gotten. Yeah. I don't, I don't, watch, I don't even watch. I don't even think I watch crossover. I tried to get into it uh, with, with Arrowverse. And I think I watched like the first season and I was just like, of what? I, don't, I don't feel ne- uh, the Arrow. Uh, hmm. Arrow just i don't feel like i need to continue this you know yeah it's it's an acquired taste i I thought they one and two especially season two they did a good job the flashback storytelling was interesting um i i think that they did a good job there i think the flash i really gave them credit for um who is the name of the guy who is um plays eobard thawn in season one he was also on was that chuck whatever it was yeah. Kavanaugh, Tom Kavanaugh. I think it was Tom Kavanaugh. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So. The whole Reverse season, Flash. season one of the Flash. It it, it, it was, it, what was really good about it was you had a great, you had the greatest villain, the Flash's greatest villain, the Reverse Flash, mm-hmm. and you knew he was bad at the beginning, but you couldn't quite figure out exactly why or what his motivation was, and that and that kept you moving through. The season, even though a lot of the episodes were kind of predictable, villain of the week, yeah, a little Archie. Yeah, that's the problem with the Flash is he's an incredibly overpowered character. So unless you really nerf him, it's hard. That's the joke. He's like, it's like, what happened? He got away. What do you mean he <laughs> got away? In one of the seasons, you ran to China and back in mm-hmm. four seconds. What do you mean he got away? So that that well, you have such an overpowered. It's like Superman. You have such an overpowered character. Yeah. You had the to figure out is the weakness for you know a villain to exploit. It's hard to um, but with the but with the reverse flash and what he was doing, I thought I thought it was um, it was just a good arc with with all of that. Uh, and then but then after that is it just became it became so repetitive when it's like you're stuck in a formula. That's when a lot of these shows like series go bad when mm-hmm. it's just like the writers. It's the same with any like The Simpsons or anything else. The writers just say, oh, well, we've got the formula. We'll just slot in new things for the formula. But it's like, well, we can tell it's the same. You have a new villain, but it's the same story arc we've heard that, before. You got to try something new a little. Marvel has has done a good job of doing something new with yes. series. Oh, yeah. with, the, like, with, the, with the MCU, with the films, the, they, um, if they've learned from mistakes and they've allowed directors to have freedom to make different kinds of movies. And that's to their credit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and then when they launched into their series on Disney Plus with uh, WandaVision and Loki and uh, Falcon yeah. and the Winter Soldier and Hawkeye, yeah, yeah. like I'm not going to talk about the last two, but... <clears throat> yeah. which that is was hard. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I I didn't watch Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I'm like, eh. 
Yeah. We like Hawkeye. I'm a big fan of of Falcon as Captain America. Yeah. Right. I I love that that concept. I love that 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 line. Right. Yeah. But the yeah, series just the kind series of felt like just, a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. And Hawkeye, I was like, I want more Hawkeye in my Hawkeye. Well, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I can see, that. It, I I can see that. I enjoyed it was... as a Christmas movie. You know. I wonder. So here's a conceptual question. I wonder if you know the Marvel stuff has been more successful because of the platform they have being acquired by Disney. And it just makes you think of a different analogy, but like, you know, they have a lot more resource, a lot more capital to be able to take risk in those ways. Um, whereas DC does not, right? They're more focused on just the the blockbuster movies they have to make. No, um, I don't. But they know. were taking off before then. Like, I mean, they had well, taken. Well, no, but I'm just thinking like another example was like totally different universe, right? But the show, The Boys, uh, that was pitched to yeah. Sony years ago, right? And they tried their their darndest to make it work, and they never could. Um, and then it was repitched to Amazon, which has mm. a lot more different resource and different approach. Right. They took an innovative. Yeah, they took an innovative like approach, and, and then it's more successful. So I I'm think wondering, in freedom though, uh, when you do a yeah. series, you have freedom to do things like you couldn't make a Wandavision movie; it'd be too weird. People wouldn't go right. see it. But the series is weird, but it's enough where it's a niche to get people to get people into it. So right. yeah. I don't buy that though, because Warner Brothers has deep pockets. They could yeah. have done a DC if they had, and what they should have done is they could have just started with Wonder Woman. You star a Wonder Woman, that um, that paves the way, and uh, then you build up uh, other. And really, you start with start with that, and then because they learned their lessons the hard way. Because then after that, you're right. I liked Aquaman. I liked Shazam. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked Wonder yeah. Woman. I forget that Shazam's part of the DC. <laughs> I know because it feels like a totally different good. movie because they were allowed to take risks. It's not mo- It's not yeah. the multiverse, but it's yeah. also yeah. not yeah. Marvel as much either so it's like they could have built up their own justice league by doing one character at a time mm-hmm. but they kind of jumped the gun yeah and then tie everything together and then they could have yeah. done other things i mean this and, still might be on the table but i think it'd be cool if they could do a batman beyond movie and have michael keaton as old batman that would be awesome. and um that would i mean that's the obvious casting i think they're thinking of that well they might well, i think they're have... sorry they're gonna have michael keaton in the flash i think in that and we film. still uh, have right. jack nicholson and and danny devito around too right, right. <laughs> and, so, and that's that's what i was gonna say like here, right warner brothers did a really good job with the the batman trilogy trilogy with christian bale right yes. like just that val kilmer that was fantastic at like, least they, the first they, two they, movies it, but yeah that's how <laughs> The, yeah. the, the third, third yeah. is a lot. I mean, it's just like Return of the Jedi. It happens in the third right. movie. Yeah. Right. But yeah, that, like, but they, they they built up support. Yeah. They got a following with those movies and, and they did a really good job. And then they threw it away. And then they threw it away. Exactly. I lived in the darkness. Well, and isn't that like, for me, the DC movies, a lot of times the villain like you've said, their motivation is a little like vague and also like their actions seem not to have a coherent, like, like cause and effect. I don't know for us or for me, at least when we'd be watching the DC movies, I'd be like, I don't totally understand why people are doing what they're doing. Right. Yeah. It's that's vague, not so much of a problem or it's Marvel. cliche. Like, yeah, in, or it's cliche. Like or they're just crazy. League, in Justice League, Justice League, Steppenwolf might have been could have been any CGI bad guy in a video game. Yeah. Right. Same goals, same look. The only mm-hmm. ones that are interesting, like the movies that we like, like think about it. You don't like Justice League. You don't like Batman versus Superman. But like Shazam, Aquaman. Suicide and... Squad. Um, we haven't really talked about that. Oh, one. yeah. Let's, we'll that was that. The, that's the third one that I like. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. that I was going to mention earlier. Well, I've thought on that. But like, let's take like <laughs> Aquaman and um, Shazam. It's like, oh, I can understand the villain's motivation here. One, mm-hmm. one is a family. One is a little bit like Black Panther. It's a family dynamic wanting yeah. to have royal control. Blah, 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 blah. And then Shazam is someone who's always had a bit of a uh, inferiority complex who mm-hmm. wants power because they've been they were bullied even as a small child. No, that's good. I mean, it's not groundbreaking villain stuff. Right. Right. Suicide Squad's interesting. Are you talking about the original Suicide Squad or the Suicide Squad? The Which Harley, the uh, Will Smith. Yeah, there, there the, are two. The Margot Robbie. All right, Margot, Margot Robbie's in She's both. both. Yeah. She's in both, yeah. Right. So I, I actually enjoyed both of them, hmm. okay? 
Um, I would say that I probably enjoyed the first one more. Hmm. Um, and the, the second one was, was, was fun, but it was also kind of, it, it was really kooky and out there. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, anytime you, you have giant starfish. Crop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the but first they, one, but they I, wanted, I really and enjoyed. that's the thing to make these movies, you have to kind of go for gold with, um, yeah, with all that. So. And I think they did a did a, a a decent job of putting together a team of people that you don't really know, mm-hmm. right? And, but they they didn't try to build up anybody's story really, and so it was just like here's this team of people. Well, the like, movie was edited by a video a, a, a movie trailer company. <laughs> like you know, okay, well that's that, why that, it feels so weird when you watch it. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, and but, I think with DC movies for me at least, there's always kind of a feel of, there's a lot of psychological issues. <laughs> like, like it just feels like everyone has psychological issues. And in Marvel, and, and maybe that's relatable because we're humans and we have psychological issues, but it feels like a lot. <laughs> like, I think like it's really just lazy writing. Out there it's lazy writing be like, oh, well, the bad guy's yeah. crazy. That's he's why crazy. He's crazy, <laughs> right. But that's Whereas, like, well, with Marvel, well, it's like, that's why Thanos is great. He's not crazy. He's just evil. Right. Yep. And to me, Marvel feels no, more like the culture of death versus the culture of life. A lot of times that it's, mm. it's not, Oh, they're just insane. It's like, here's people who have bought into the idea that death is better than life or that, or that there's the, too that many the humans. Means, yeah. That the, the ends justify intrinsically evil means. Yep. Right. Thanos Ooh, is trying to achieve a good, even if it's messy. Right. Uh, Killmonger is, uh, is trying right. to achieve a good for people, even if it's yep. going to require violence. Right. Yep. Um, Let's so, talk about what would be ahead. between DC and Marvel. What is the more Catholic conception oh, sure. of the universe? The more pro-life. Um, I, would, I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, too. I don't. Well, um, it depends what you mean by by Catholic conception. When I try to think of like characters that are Catholic, the only ones I can really think of are from the Marvel universe. Uh, yeah, the two biggest more. would be like Daredevil and Nightcrawler, mm-hmm. um, and they're done. Uh, they're done very well in in that regard. So, uh, like yeah. I think I was showing my kids the X Men animated series. Actually, they finished yeah. watching it all on. Um, That's love it. Plus. I bought shout that. out to Cal Dodd. What? Yeah. Uh, so shout out to Cal Dodd. Uh, he was the voice of Wolverine in the animated series. We did an interview with him. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. It was, we, it was also awesome. Did, uh, Childhood dream come true. <laughs> hey, yeah. bub. Yeah. Exactly. We also uh, interviewed Chris Potter, who is Gambit, true. who's also Catholic. I think he was a Canadian doing his best to do a Cajun accent. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, mon ami. There's <laughs> yeah. plenty of gators in the bayou. Sorry. It's actually not that far off from. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Spot on. But, but when I, I showed the kids, made, I remember like 15 years ago, I uh, ordered on eBay bootlegged copies of those episodes. Yeah, you couldn't find DVD. them forever. No, you, you couldn't. So I had the was... DVDs and I was like, guys, check this out. I actually have the old X-Men animated series. And then not all of them worked, but like it was still enough. <laughs> and now they're and now my kids, they, they blasted through uh, all of it in like, you know, mm-hmm. two weeks. Um, but I thought that that was it was neat to go back and watch it with them and and talk to them about it. But there was the episode where they introduced Nightcrawler yep. and Wolverine's having a crisis of faith and Nightcrawler helps him to understand God's purpose. Like, why would God make me mutants? You know, why would he make mutants? It's like, well, God has a plan for all of us, Logan. Yeah, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it, but that was, I mean, I was like, this, and I told my wife, I was like, see, this is the 90s when you can have an episode of Saturday morning cartoons that talks about yeah. God and you should believe right. in him. Now yeah. it you just... have Wolverine kneeling in front of a crucifix. Oh man, yeah, final it was shot. awesome! Oh my gosh! Yeah, and oh, that, that's man. actually one of the things we talked with Cal Dodd about was that scene. Oh yeah, I think that like, was his favorite that episode. Was, that was his favorite episode. Yeah, yeah. wow, that's really uh, now I'm geeking out. You guys got the chance to uh, do that. I met when I was at Comic Con before the pandemic. I met Larry Houston, who was one of the uh, yeah. producers on the show, and he yeah. was a super cool, super cool guy. It was nice. Yeah, we regret not getting a chance to. He was at that same Comic Con the other guys were at. We missed that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, I don't know. I think Marvel might take the the edge on that a little bit. It's interesting. Both Marvel and DC, like when you talk about like, because it's hard because DC has like the new gods. Marvel has Celestials. But both Marvel and DC have 
a character that represents God. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget which is which. One of them is the one above all, and the other is, oh, what is the other one? Let's see, how can I not? So there's one above all. That's Marvel. Yeah, and that so. that's basically God, or it represents mm-hmm. Stanley or Jack Kirby or you know, whatever. <laughs> right. yeah. And then um, the one, the one in the presence. It's the presence <laughs> in DC. So there we go. I knew it was one above the one above all. And the presence, you know, the idea is that even amongst all this, there has to be one infinite creator of everything. Which mm-hmm. both of those names are like, because the presence kind of sounds like he who is, you know, right. like just or the bread of the presence, is. or but I like one of the above presence. all because you think about God, He's a maximally great being. There's nothing greater than yeah. God. right, so right. The so they're both all. accurate. Yeah, yeah. But the presence kind of feels a bit more Catholic to me. Maybe I don't know. Because From a philosophical because we, theology, I like one above all, but really, because <laughs> yeah, I was because, thinking like as Catholics, we see God as both above all, but also sure. so near, yeah, you know, at the same time. Yeah. Sure. So I feel like a lot of things could have a presence, but there's only one that is a one that's above true. All. Yeah. That's true. You're right. But yeah. together, sure. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> they work really great. Yeah, yeah. Crossover. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I would I would argue that DC, uh, you know, maybe if we start with Superman, the Siegel and Schuster, the a somewhat more Jewish conception of their world. Um, Superman, obviously, very Moses like and being set adrift in the universe, and uh, so even though Stan Lee is Jewish. I would... Oh yeah, well the creators of Superman, yeah, it was two um Sh- Siegel, Siegel and Schuster. Yeah. They're two uh, J- uh they're both Jewish, so it totally makes sense. And and Lex Luthor was I think taken from a magazine about the Ubermensch, you know, yeah. it was it was you know, and then on the other side you have Magneto, um, you know, as, oh, as yeah. a Holocaust survivor. Uh, yeah. I, I love the the Jewish roots of, mm-hmm. of both the the well, X Men especially, it is very poignant in that it talks about you know how human beings are cruel to those who are different, and so I do appreciate that and the elements and the fact yeah. that uh, Magneto and Professor X are they are paralleled to Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X yep. that both mm-hmm. of them have valid points in their struggle for civil rights yeah. that both you know they both make valid points in their different approaches so yeah. i do appreciate that more relatable social commentary uh in the comics uh and i think that's, that's I why want. x-men x-men is my favorite like mm. by far I love X Men. The, the movies obviously aren't as good as the uh, as the rest of the MCU. It's not. Well, I they got to give credit. X Men. They, they got to give credit where credit's due. They were like kicking it off before it was even kicked off. We won't talk about Blade, but you know, after Blade, <laughs> no, yeah. correct, correct, which is good. But it was really it was that 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 started the ball rolling. Was yeah. was them and X Two is a super good movie. Oh, I I enjoyed them all. Like I, I'll go back and watch them at least once a year. Right? I can't watch X Three. Uh, I do it. I do it just to get through it. Uh, <laughs> I think X Men: The Animated Series is still the best version of the Phoenix Saga that we have. Oh yeah. I, oh, absolutely. Oh, by no far. Doubt. No. By doubt. far, the the Phoenix Saga. Is, I, so I, I back back in high school, I got the uh, the digital version of the first forty years of X Men, and it like I just I loved it. I just kind of yeah breeze right through it and the phoenix saga is incredible and so i was really angry whenever they messed it up not once, they messed it up twice but twice yeah. twice yeah. They still kind of get the it same right. way didn't they like it's kind of similar <laughs> yeah she kills <laughs> professor x versus killing uh, they still yeah because that was what was that what was the name of that recent one they had the girl from game of thrones and they did it oh X- um was that that was an apocalypse was it no it was, no no I thought of, I liked the. Or is it just Phoenix so. or what was I, I thought I, it was Phoenix or something? I can't like that. even remember what it was called. I didn't go see it once again. I can't waste my time on bad movies. What yeah. made that movie even worse was oh, that oh, they yeah. reshot and redid the whole third act because the original plan was for the Phoenix to go in space and destroy all the alien ships from the um, the Shi'ar. What was it? the Shi'ar? It was just whoever. And then they realize, oh, never mind. Captain Marvel already did it, so we'll yeah. put <laughs> him on a train. Bro. I'm like, oh, come, come on. 
Yeah. See, and that that's like Phoenix. Dark Phoenix. A dark Phoenix. Dark that's what Phoenix it was called. Dark Phoenix. Oh, um, dark. Phoenix is such a powerful character oh, in, yeah. in the comics, like just incredibly powerful. And and I, I actually enjoy it. So you mentioned Captain Marvel. So uh, I love the Captain Marvel comics. I think yeah. Carol Danvers is an incredible character. I cannot They did stand. a good job with her in, um, I liked her little appearance in What If? And, uh, yeah. When she asked yeah, to she, fuck. She that's, was, that's, she, that's Captain Marvel. <laughs> yeah, it's like, let's see you just that's, punch a super powerful guy into the center of a planet. And then make some kind of smart A remark, right? Yeah, that's like, good. Yeah. Can and we then it's just it? like, oh, you had to make it. You had well, to have Brie Larson and all her nonsense. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's just uh, what I am just sick of is just this idea like just because you don't like strong female protagonist. Oh, that's yeah. why you don't. That's why you but don't we like loved it. Wonder Woman. Uh, no. Yeah. I like one. Well, Wonder you Woman only like great. female protagonists that are the male gaze. Of course, you love Wonder Woman. My wife would say, that. of course, you love Wonder Woman. <laughs> I remember on Father's Day when it came out, I told her, oh, me and the guys are going to go see a superhero movie. She's like, OK. I'm like, oh, I went and saw Wonder Woman. She's like, what? You went and saw Wonder Woman? I'm like, what's well, a superhero movie? Yeah. <laughs> but no, it doesn't like I'll give you an example, like Ripley from Aliens mm -hmm. or Sarah Connor in Terminator. They're not like a stereotypical model or right. anything not like that, all. but they are a very strong, relatable female protagonist and sigourney mm -hmm. weaver is like very motherly in alien yes so she's feminine but without it's not like stereotypical you it's know not weak. it's not weak sauce feminine no it's it's, it's not strong it's like i can it's kind of like i see this sometimes in the catholic world and i worry about this that some catholic speakers and personalities like they get obsessed with like talking about masculinity all the time like, what does it mean to be a Catholic man? And here's I'm smoking my cigars and I'm doing all this and I'm being manly. <laughs> you know what? Actually, when you're really when you're masculine, you don't have to talk about that. I think somebody mm -hmm. asked me once, like, what do you do to to develop your masculinity? I'm like, nothing. I be a man. <laughs> I'm just a man and I live my life. I'm a good I'm a good father and husband. <laughs> I, I'm not God, so you worried your about chest it. There. I have to project it all the time because I'm quite comp. And so I see like in these movies, you have the character, the female protagonist who's worried about being feminine in the political correct way. They become Mary Sue's. That's the problem that it's like, oh, well, we can't have like it's weird in Captain Marvel. It's like her flaw is supposed to be like she's too emotional. But then it's like when the wrong actress for that. Right. But then like when in the movie she's she's wooden throughout the entire thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you couldn't actually show her getting emotional and crying about something because then, oh, she's a stereotypical emotional woman. Mm -hmm. So then there's like this weird thing you have in modern movies. You have a female protagonist and she has to be perfect because if she had a flaw, then that would be, oh, you're stereotyping women. No, just get. That's why Wonder Woman works because her flaw is naivety. That is her flaw in mm -hmm. Wonder Woman. She's naive. And they blew that in the last act uh, of Wonder Wonder Woman is great until the third act. And then it's just another forgettable CGI fight. And she defeats Ares, whatever his name is. Throwing tanks around or whatever. Yeah. They, and she defeats him because she's the whole time she's like, it's Ares. She has a weird Israeli accent. It's supposed <laughs> to be like the mascara. It is Ares. He's he's controlling them to fight each other, and I have to stop him. Ugh. And it's like, <laughs> no, there's just bad people. And and it's like actually, World War II was caused by the darkness in human hearts. There's good people and bad people. And then she beats him up, and all the guys like seem like they're good now, like the Germans or whatever. I was like, what? <laughs> the whole the whole point was that she got duped because she's she's naive about these things, mm -hmm. and that's a good weakness. And then it, it dropped the ball, but it made it further than other DC movies. So, <laughs> and and speaking of great female actresses in in Marvel, that would be the only reason Spider Man is not relatable is because Aunt May is Marissa Tomei. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. not fair you know that's aunt may is not a geriatric anymore i know <laughs> right i love that they play that for jokes they're just yeah. like oh i am may. i give them or credit should we no say way... that it was aunt may what not that <gasps> oh! <laughs> that's my cousin eh. scott hasn't seen spider-man no way home yet oh yeah don't what? So... Yeah. That's it. That's <laughs> right? 
there are. I can't see it before because Exodus I was, 90 I'm glad started. you said that. Because I mean, I was no, like, no, oh, drop no. all the spoilers. He had. Oh yeah, this is on no. you. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Mm-hmm. No, I'll be good. <laughs> He's but trying will, to blame Exodus this, 90, this, but yeah, I'm completely pulling my Exodus 90 blame card on that. without without spoilers. No Way Home is a great movie because in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that is the first time we see Spider Man. Mm-hmm. That is the first time we see Spider man not spider boy boy, not spider high school student (laughs) or spider pig (laughs) yeah Yeah. right spider pig uh he's spider it doesn't you don't get that till the end of the film really but it's like oh this is spider man very good and that's and that's where it's where it's done right in that regard yeah which actually i haven't seen it either i haven't seen it either but it it kind of pulls back to we just watched far from home and mm-hmm. that's like part of the theme in that movie too is he he's not confident in himself. No, right? No. Like he falls prey to someone else convincing him that they're more worthy of the the gift that Tony he didn't him, even right? he didn't even try to convince him. He just sort of convinced himself yeah. and then was like, right. here, take. I'm right. pretty sure Taylor take Swift wrote a, a song about Mysterio doing that to Spider Man. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <sighs> that was Jake Gyllenhaal, right? I'm not. Yeah, Jake yeah. Gyllenhaal. Okay. Yeah. Right. Is it Gyllenhaal? I think it's Gehuenhal. <laughs> There's like a video that's online. Like, how is your last name pronounced? It's Gehuenhal. <laughs> it's Homer Hickam. Right. I've that's been right. Gyllenhaal my whole he should have stopped it at October Sky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so should Laura Dern. But anyway, that's a Star Wars reference. One Didn't... one last thing with the femininity thing was that I, as a woman, felt like that scene in um, Endgame where all the women just kind of stop what they're doing and all come yeah. together you know what i'm talking about oh yeah where i, I was like she's, Women Avengers she's got help. <laughs> to me it was like this is so offensive because oh, yeah. like right. a woman can't handle it unless all the other women just stop fighting and band around her collectively and defend her like i mean her- i'll give them it's a cool scene i'll give them that but you're right it's like it was Wait. it just felt forced. It felt a little forced. Yeah. But and at apparently least apparently that was the toned down version because people yeah, thought it was, it was too the toned forced. down version. Oh, but gosh. like what was it gonna be? The, the, yeah. Like how did they all end up in the same spot during this huge battle? Unoccupied. And they just all stopped doing what they were doing and just hey, let's go yeah. do this instead. Yeah, right. It was just forced. And they were all free to do that. It's it, like it was like supposed to be female solidarity, but to me it, it felt more like I don't know. It felt more like that women need something that men don't, you know, that women need like a whole football team to get it it's done. Their in, it's their intuition. They knew they need. They knew. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. They were, they're connected <laughs> and they all knew. So one they're in the... sync. <laughs> oh, in sync. Uh, Those are all basically girls too. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. What? No, no, no. Those we don't of, we don't dis in sync in this joint. <laughs> I wanted to uh see between DC and Marvel the best rogues gallery, the weirdest villain. I wanted to um see oh, what sure. I think DC is definitely gonna have the weirdest villain if I had to uh, Marvel's got some pretty list. weird ones out there. I don't know. Um, I mean, Thanos is basically just Planned Parenthood. And, um, <laughs> man, the in the comics, he went around in the Thanos special Thanos helicopter. Did he? He did. In the, the comics Thanos. Thanos uh, now we we have to acknowledge the comics Thanos is completely different from the MCU. Thanos. Oh, he's a joke. He's a joke in the comics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they did a good job adapting it uh, to make him yeah. actually. Um, and his motivation is different, right? His, his motivation is completely in the different. comics. He, he just tries to end all life to impress the personification of Lady death, of death. death. Yeah, Mistress Death. Yep, and it actually is a competition between him and um, I say it's a competition, they're both trying to impress Lady Death. It's him and um, wow, that guy. I'm, I'm not, it's not Daredevil, it's the other one that Deadpool, Deadpool, <laughs> yeah. Which Deadpool. we haven't talked about at all. Which we, ha- right. yeah. So De- Deadpool. apparently Deadpool's a lapsed Catholic. Just well, I was to... about to say, I think Deadpool's the most Catholic movie of all. Of <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. The second one in particular. <laughs> oh, man. No. Yeah. I don't, the like best or weirdest <laughs> rogues gallery. Um, I don't know. There's so many iconic villains in each. I feel like The Edge, though, 
is going to have to go to, um, I, I might want to give it to DC. I don't know. Like you have Lex Luthor. You have someone like Darkseid, who I think Darkseid is like a million times more menacing than Thanos. Um, I think Batman's rogues gallery. I mean, just not, if you pick, yeah, for, if you pick a rogues gallery for one hero, yeah, like yeah. that is the most iconic rogues gallery to yeah, me. Like iconic. people can remember think not, the Joker, Riddler, Two Face, and they're all just weird and bizarre. And I mean, yeah. but wouldn't the best rogues gallery actually be like Rogue? <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> the worst. <laughs> that, what's hard about that that's where x-men i almost wish they didn't have rogue in the x-men movies because like if she doesn't steal captain marvel's powers she's just kind of a liability yeah you, like quit the, touching people the, rogue. yeah quit touching people i mean that's the, that's like, the hard thing i could see you putting her on a fighting team because i mean if you train her train in like, the hand, other person if you trained her in hand-to-hand combat mm-hmm. and weapons and you had a member of your team who can steal the powers of someone else. If you're fighting as a team, that is a good member to deploy. You'll need to give them protection. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they can disable the powers of another opponent, that's right. huge. But like, you know, it's like she's supposed to be the member of the team. And it's just like, I remember, I think it was like X3 or something where like mm-hmm. she's in the danger room and she like steals Colossus's powers so she doesn't get hurt. I'm like, that's that's not how you should be using the team. Right. Isn't she trying to do that to Apocalypse and gets fried? Yeah. Well, that happens in the comics too when she tries to from mm-hmm. from certain people. She can't absorb it. But yeah, I don't know. I think I think probably the Batman Rogues Gallery. I don't know. It's almost Shakespearean. The people yeah. I, I really do it. hope that's how they introduce Rogue into the Marvel Universe, though. Uh they that they, they reintroduce her by her taking Brie Larson's powers. <laughs> she puts Brie Larson oh. in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> one can hope. Fingers crossed. <laughs> one can hope. Out of business, <laughs> right? So, oh, I man. if we were to do the weirdest DC villain, we had talked about Mitzplik or whatever his name is. Oh Mr. yeah, Mister Mixius Bitlick, uh, the the fifth dimensional imp that tortures Superman. And is is that the one that Superman has to say his name backwards? Yes, he's in, there. Yeah. Is a great run called uh, Emperor Joker. Or it's like I think it's Emperor Joker, and that that's a great one to show like those the crazy bad guys. Yeah. In it, the Joker. So Mister Mixus Pit like is a fifth dimensional being, so he has almost reality warping powers. It's almost godlike what he can do that he can change things, manipulate reality. And he, Superman he has to trick him. He basically did what Wanda did to yeah. herself. Yeah, basically he can just do that, and he's a trickster more. And so he, if Superman says his name backwards, it sends him back to the fifth dimension. And so he's always having to do that. In Emperor Joker, Mitzis Pitlick gets tired of teasing Superman and goes after the Joker. But the Joker tricks Mitzis Pitlick into saying his secret fifth dimensional or imp name. And that allows, like he was planning, oh, Mitzis Pitlick's plan was to give the Joker 1% of his powers to see like what craziness the Joker would do. But the Joker tricks him into keeping 1% of his powers and giving 99% of them to the Joker. Oh, wow. And so then the comic series opens with Superman in prison and he has no idea what's going on. And he keeps escaping. And Bizarro always finds him and puts him back in prison. And he's like, what in the world is going on? And it turns out the Joker, uh, he just kills Batman every day because he can. Uh, and he does whatever he wants. And Superman's trying to find a way to team up with Mr. Spitlick to um, resolve. But the Joker does crazy stuff. Like he just decides to eat all the people of China in a giant Chinese food box. Just because he can. That's that's what I can't get with with DC is it all just feels kind of demented, <laughs> crazy. I don't know. I like when it gets over the top. <laughs> See, well, I, I think know. it's a personality thing that's not my personality <laughs> oh the other okay. thing about marvel um marvel you're like what's more catholic uh someone asked me this in an episode recently on a li- live stream like is it okay that dr doom uses the nails from christ's crucifixion in his armor to fight vampires you know so it's hey. like that's that's over the top too i'm like well yeah you're recognizing that he's um well, Kitty right, Pride, right. who always wears the Star of David, used that to repel uh, Dracula. I think at, at some point, which that's a yeah. little bit of a of a 
um, stretch maybe, but it's because she had this um, authentic, genuine faith. Right. That they're acknowledging like the legitimacy on some level of Of the power of faith of these things. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I feel like the MCU has gotten away from really any religious themes since, or not maybe themes, but like any overtly religious lines or people since that line in the first Avengers movie about there's only one God. And he doesn't dress like that. I know. I love that Um, line. And that's the end of that. But yeah, but there's Mm -hmm. like an abundance of pro-life lines. Like I'm on the side of life, you know, trade in lives. Yeah. Yeah. We don't trade in life. Like there's a million, I mean, I guess not a million. There's a bunch of (laughs) pro-life lines. Thank you for nerding out with us. The Catholic nerds. This has been Scott Smith, Mary Reed, Cody Reed, Colby Allen, and Trent Horn. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.